Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we want to welcome Ms. Gloria Nowden. She is the VP of Marketing and Communications at City First Bank of DC, successfully rebranding and raising its social impact profile while driving deposit lending and new business growth to double bottom line its bottom line mission. City First DC is, is DC's first community development financial institution bank with, and the first certified B Corporation bank with more than $400 million in assets and over $1.3 billion invested in low wealth communities since its founding in 1998. City First Broadway was the, is the largest black led bank in the nation. City First Bank, not Broadway. <laughs> no, you're right. I'm sorry? I'll explain later, you have it Okay. <laughs> Gloria began her career at Black Entertainment Television, BET, during its historic startup year, serving as the marketing director of the office of the chairman, Robert L. Johnson, strategic business development group, and was charged with launching growth initiatives at BET.com, BET Soundstage as well. Prior to that, she was also the executive assistant to Deborah Lee, the president, and the CSR liaison for the co-founder, Shayla Johnson. After six years of successful growth at BET, she ran her own creative agency, for the next decade with clients such as BET, Radio One, Influence Network, Red Bull, DC Promise Network Initiative, and MHUSA. Her deep passion for civic and community engagement led her to public service as the youngest executive director to helm the DC Commission of Arts and Humanities. Appointed by the entrepreneurial mayor, Adrian M. Femty, Gloria was able to advance the mission of the multi-million dollar grant making agency by implementing DEI strategies that increased funding opportunities and access to the arts exponentially to help transform communities. Gloria is a proud mother of two daughters. She is engaged in her community as a leader, as a member of the Leadership Washington, Greater Washington's 25th class and a founding chapter of the 100 Black Women of DC, DCBW, founding board member of the DC Community Development Consortium and member of the U Street Business Council and women of color in community development. Uh, Gloria, thank you so much, uh, uh, so much for joining us this morning. I was almost exhausted reading all those achievements and commitments and you truly have an amazing record. Uh, uh, what's your drive? Wow, my drive is um, people, people. I think uh, humans are the greatest asset to the world. Um, we're, we're, we're natural force. And uh, my drive is just to, um, you know, develop myself and in, 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 in so doing also, you know, um, want to be a part of developing humanity um, in a way that's optimal. All right. So uh, you people, people, that's my drive, people. That's great. Uh, you did mention City First Broadway, so you'd explain a little bit what's a uh... Sure. Yeah. So City First Bank um, is founded in 1998 and, City, uh, and Broadway is the bank that uh, we just merged with out in Los Angeles. So our imprint, our footprint has gone from uh, D.C. to Los Angeles um, on April 1st. So we just recently merged to become the largest black bank with now a billion dollars in assets. So it's the idea of coming together um, uh, to be sustainable and grow. So it's part of our um, scale strategy. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, thanks. I, I, that's something I didn't even know. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so you have both African-American and Korean and, uh, ancestry. So your mother owned a small business and how did you, how did that all influence your background as an entrepreneurial character? So yes, my father's African-American, both are deceased. My dad um, was in the military. So he met a Korean um, entrepreneur my mom um, in Korea during the Vietnam War. So it was, um, you know, 68. Um, and, you know, America, it was very tumultuous in America already, right? Yeah. With uh, race relations and, you know, black soldiers like Muhammad Ali not wanting to go um, as far as their, their philosophy. But my dad coming from a sharecropper community, um, a descendant of slaves, um, goes into a foreign land, meets this Korean entrepreneurial woman, um, you know, not quite sure if it was legal to be married, but they married in Korea. I was born in Korea. And then um, he was then shipped back to America. So, um, you know, my mom had broken English. If she spoke English at all for the first couple of years in America. So, you know, you have to figure out how to survive. And on the military income, you're not, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're low income. 
So my mom just uh, using her instinct for being able to create, you know, something out of nothing. Um, and in Korea, you know, it, it's more patriarchal in, in its society. So it's, um, you know, they don't really, you know, value educating women, uh, you're a, a domestic. And so, um, she, you know, just watching her go from, you know, being a janitor basically at a, a at a, a hospital to you know cashier to washing dishes to then become you know raising enough saving enough cash uh, to go to a bank to get traditional capital um, but then also you know in the Korean community they do have a network um, of finance they have a financial model um, that's very friends and family angel round um, investments if you will um, and then it you know it what informed me was just that she was a community lender. So the community itself, they were lending to each other. And so the notion of not being able to access um, capital, uh, traditional capital at lower rates, something I you know, started learning early on. Um, and, you know, um, again, America is still plagued with racism. It was my mother that was able to get the um, loan from, you know, the banks and not necessarily my father. Um, although he was a soldier, right, and served 22 years. Um, so yeah, so that that entrepreneurial instinct, you know, it is part, uh, the entrepreneurial culture is part of the American culture. Um, and so my mom fit in just great, because, you know, it's really about, you know, out being able to outwork someone else. You don't always have to be the smartest one in the room, but sometimes the hardest working one. So um, just having to put together um, an entire business, you have to be, it's almost like running nonprofits too. If you're just starting it, you have to be the marketer, you know, the, the fundraiser, the development officer, the chief executive officer. And so you learn a lot of skill sets quickly um, if you're a kid growing up in that environment. So it's been very helpful for me in my career. That's awesome. That's, that's great hearing about like your whole family's history and background there. Uh, so question, so you were there during the, basically during the development years of Black Entertainment Television, or BET as we know it, uh, you were there right at the beginning. Like what were the challenges you had to face as a marketing director at BET in order to consolidate the network as a comprehensive media company? So, you know, I've been thinking a lot about the history of BET and Radio One in DC. They were the first two black technology companies. So media is technology. Right, it's just all how you look at it, and so yes, it's it's in the sector and industry of entertainment, but it is in this broader um, environment of technology. And I just remember um, we spent a lot of time as we were about to um, not go public. It was when we were about to settle to Viacom, but in '96, the Telecommunications Act. We spent a lot of time at the federal uh, federal communications council. There's a different FCC here in DC at the federal uh, communications commission, sorry. And then, you know, so it dawns on you, wow, we're talking about spectrum, satellites, you know, airwaves and, and, and the right to own those things so that you can have entertainment and box it up and, you know, distribute it. So, um, so in the early years, we had a single revenue stream and that would be, you know, the, you know, the taking content and pushing it out over this, this new technology called cable. Um, over the years, um, the concept of branding came out um, right around know, 98, 2000. And so it was about how can you multiply your brand um, through ancillary revenue streams? And the question was why? And it's because, you know, this thing called the internet was about to come and you needed to be able to, you know, um, you know bring shareholders greater value. So you can't just have one cash cow called advertising revenue. You know, can this brand um, live in people's hearts so strongly that, you know, they will now go to a restaurant called BET? Will they rock a shirt, you know, with BET on it? Um, will they go to a concert if it was BET branded? So it was what's the essence of this brand that makes people want to follow and create the value that then the shareholders, of course, you know, get a return on. Um, so I was there when it was private. And we were in a Georgetown office and then we came over to Northeast. So then, um, and right before we came to Northeast, we um, became public. So it was the first black company to be publicly traded um, on New York Stock Exchange. And we launched at $11. So watching it go from a mom and pop shop. And even before that, I grew up on it. So it was about 12 years prior to me actually working there as a 21 year old. 
and then um, just having the opportunity again to be an entrepreneur in an entrepreneurial place at a time of growth and contributing really just ideas, right? So even though I was Deborah Lee's assistant, um, environments that are growing um, really, so it's not diversity, equity, inclusion, the way we think of it today, they look at like who's thinking around them. Um, so owners and Paolo probably can relate, like, you know, that you have a skill set, yes, but uh, owners are usually very open to ideas. I mean, they will literally say, I value ideas. Like, I definitely need you to do your job, your skill set that I'm paying you for. But what I'm valuing is what you're thinking about. Um, and for me, it was, you know, I was the young person. So it's like, so what are, what are the young people, what's your generation moving to? What's motivating them? Um, and uh, not only that, but like, you know, if you have a business mind, then you're thinking, entrep you're, you're thinking uh, in, in, in business terms for the owner as well. So um, for us to go be from mom and pop to going public um, to then um, going private again, um, it was just, it was the greatest experience of my life to literally um, be sitting there and as a marketing agent, you know, helping to drive that, right? Um, and a lot of it had to do with going into the community. Um, we weren't just in these four walls. It was taking our body of work and what we believed um, outside of the compound of BET. And so we did um, HBCU campus tours. Um, mm -hmm. We did corporate social responsibility. So we took an approach, you know, we did the institutional, you know, participation and commitments to, you know, like the National Urban League, NAACP. And that is where, you know, I would go represent, you know, Bob and Sheila Johnson. Um, and at the same time, you know, working in Ward 8, right? And I did that personally. And then bringing, you know, the youth from Ward 8 into Ward 5 to see, wow, do you know, you know, you're stepping into the largest black owned company in the world right now. And you see a black chairman, a black woman CEO, you see, you know, um, creative services and they're black and the camera guys are black and the talent's black. And this is a multi-billion dollar enterprise when you, you know, amplify it out. So absolute um, honor to ever work there during a historic time. And then subsequently, you know, then becoming a client as, as well as Kathy Hughes, who owns Radio One, you know, and, you know, her whole story, single mom right on 4th and 8th Street, Northeast, um, now owns 65 radio stations, which has her ranking either one or two as the largest, you know, black radio network in the United States. It's a pretty, it was pretty amazing. As someone who grew up watching BET and like listening to Radio One, I mean, it's pretty amazing to see that the, how much they grew in just, like you said, it was such a short period of time almost, it feels like it was pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. when did you decide it was, decide it was time to go solo and create your own agency? So if I wanted to impact people, and I knew that I definitely had the talent and the skill set as a marketer to do that, how can the question became for me, you know, how can I impact the social fabric of America? Um, you know, I'd always loved the power of politics. Um, and I really should say really the power of um, government, um, the governance of people, and couldn't quite figure out where culture and government intersected and if they should, and I think I was saying, yeah, I think they sh it, it should, at least at this point mm -hmm. in our very young history in America, right? And so I don't know that I was being as effective as I wanted to be at BET in that deepening of um, what it could mean to have an impact on society. Um, so yes, we were, you know, we were making people rich. We were creating this concept of black excellence. Um, we were, breaking every glass ceiling uh, at that time. And, um, and, but my heart was always with the people. And I said, we're rising, we're on private jets, we are doing the it, right? We are making history. And what about, you know, um, the girls in the Southeast that are 13 years old, um, who are not connecting to this meteoric rise? And uh, of commerce, right? So it's one of the first times where, you know, other than Black Wall Street, um, back in 21, were we seeing the surge of black enterprises rising? And, um, and, and how can corporations or how can I myself, I took it as an individual thing, um, you know, use my company, meaning myself and my talent to communicate this, articulate um, this, um, both at a grassroots level and again, at an institutional level, of course, for 
businesses. Uh, and uh, so most of my clients, of course, would naturally be from the industry I just came out of. They're like, oh, you're a free agent now, you know. So, of course, it would be, you know, Red Bull and, you know, BET, Radio 1, uh, all the entertainment brands. Um, uh, but I found my greatest um, joy coming from working with uh, Award 7. Uh, mm -hmm. It was Obama's um, grant funding that helped to jumpstart that. It was the D.C. Promise Neighborhood Initiative in Award 7. Um, and, and I got to do my digital media academy. So it was showing kids the power of media and telling your own stories and your own narrative. And, um, I'm so inspired by a book I read in college called, um, To Be a Slave by Julius Lester. And it's that direct, um, narrative, um, someone's at my door, so ask him to me. Um, uh, the, the direct narrative, um, and oral history from, the people from people um, that doesn't get muddled in um, interpretation. Uh, and so I don't know if I answered your question, but uh, that's what inspired me to start my own company. And, uh, but you know, it was hard. And then, you know, I got pregnant and, and then, you know, I got my next, next blessing of being able to work in this, in the civic space in the, in the public sector and being able to work, um, you know, for the arts commission going from commercial art now to, you know, I guess you would say fine art, but I really looked at it as community art. Definitely. Uh, talk a little bit more are about- you to, Are you guys allowed to pause by any chance? Is this like straight recorded? Uh, yeah, we can pause. Uh, you wanna- <laughs> <laughs> I just need to get the- Yeah, give me one second. <laughs> oh, okay. It was a delivery from Google. Sorry, I thought it was uh, something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, that's not a problem. Uh, <laughs> we know everyone's working, working from home, and it's still, you know, coming off the end of the, at the end of this trying time and stuff like that. Uh, so you spe spoke a little bit how it was hard, kind of starting off. Like, could you sp speak a little bit more about that? Like, what was the landscape for a young black woman entrepreneur back when you were starting off? Wow. And you know, I didn't even look at it as being a young black entrepreneur. I just looked at it as this young person who's going to jump off a cliff. And you're either going to learn how to fly or you're going to go splat. And um, the landscape was pretty ripe for this concept of content was king. That's what was on the street at the time. Content's king. You know, if you thought cable was something, wait till the Internet explodes with enough, you know, um, with enough uh, juice to like pump thousands of pieces of content at the time. So. You know, it, and, and at that time, capital wasn't really what was motivating entrepreneurs like me to step out. It was just the proliferation of content. And at the time, reality TV was getting ready to be a thing. And I remember telling our chairman at the time, I was like, you know, the future is this reality TV thing, but not in the way that you think. It's really going to be about the human stories, right? It's back to this direct narrative, right? And it's really going to be up to you leaders to figure out, are we going to tell crazy stories of the Kardashians? Are we going to tell um, more documentary style stories of um, you know, that helped to impact the lives of people. Um, and uh, that was the landscape. That's what was happening at the time. And you didn't need money because now your personal equipment, um, you could get a little camera and you could start shooting. Um, and, um, and I was doing that and I got a lot of business because of it, you know, and my niche was behind the scenes. Everything was going to be, if, if Jay-Z's on stage, I'm shooting Jay-Z backstage and I'm shooting him on his way to the concert and maybe at his dinner table. So it's like, who is this human? How do we, um, you know, peel back a couple of layers of a, of a black person or in particular for me, it was, you know, for black men. And in starting uh, my company, it was, you know, I thought about my dad a lot. Like, how do you help improve the images of black people? Because my mom being Korean didn't understand everything that had happened to black people as a Korean woman, right? And I know even today, but Korean people really still don't understand. And I would even, you know, go out to say there aren't many ethnicities or um, immigrants who have come to America that understands what's happened to like my father's um, lineage and what that is psychologically um, and, and economically. Um, so yeah, that, you know, so again, that's what was happening. That's the lane I, I, I chose to um, contribute to um, and capital wasn't an issue. Not that you asked about that part. Oh, thanks. Uh 
So you were the youngest director to ever helm the DC Commission of Arts and Humanities, as you mentioned. Uh, what, what is your vision of the role of arts and humanities in society? So um, I think that arts and humanities, you know, they're just, it's in society, it's, it's the most liberating um, role you can have if you can have it, right? Because they don't, there's not a lot of value um, put on it from a commerce perspective per se that's starting to evolve. Um, and, you know, for me, I, I like to focus on community arts. And so the value that it does to, you know, the development and the evolution of the person who walks by it, the, the kid that looks up to it, um, what it does for, you know, the person that walks by it. So as much as it can be public than it is private, um, you know, the role, especially for, you know, the arts and humanities in government is critical uh, because everybody doesn't have access to the arts. Um, you know, when you think of all the, you know, assets west of the river in Washington, D.C., you have the Kennedy Center, the ballet, the opera, the Shakespeare Theater. And, um, and, I, and I think it's also incumbent upon, you know, institutions like that uh, to have, to help create greater access where we literally have, it's not like D.C. is a melting pot and Black, white, Asian, gay, Latinos are all mixed in together. We're literally in separate neighborhoods, right? And so, you know, it's important because, you know, arts and humanities is important and, and as an industry and as, as, a, as a cultural driver to be more intentional about intersecting um, all of the arts of all the people and all the humanities and literature and philosophies and, and ideals of um, the multiplicity of, of DC in particular. We can talk globally too, but you know, DC is both local and global and has all of the levels we just talked about, right? It's, you know, it's, 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 the, it's one of the wealthiest, it's one of the poorest. Uh, it's certainly one of the most intelligent, we could argue that. Um, and so, you know, it, it, it tells the human story, you know, if, you know, it's the idea of being a humanist, right? And back to like, what are we doing if we are not just focused on people? You know, we can build buildings, but are we building people? I think that's a good segue for the uh, last question before we open up for other questions from the, uh, the rest of the team. So you mentioned City First Broadway becoming the largest black led bank in the nation. Uh, how the next five years look for you and your position as the VP of Marketing Communications? Yeah, it'd be really cool if, you know, if I could be even more creative and, 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 and maybe drop titles, right? Because, you know, I think that, you know, just all corporations, all leaders have to look at talent or the future talent pool in more dynamic ways, right? It's not just the diversity um, of their, you know, their gender, their um, race, ethnicity, or ability, but their cognitive, diversity, being open. Um, and so, you know, our company is still really new. I love being at fresh, new, open-minded places. And so for me, I think I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely going to be able to continue to influence, you know, the depth by which we are uh, impacting the community. And, um, yeah, I think it's all about taking corporations deeper. Even though it's black led, it also, you know, um, is affording me the opportunity to go deeper in the community. And, it, and it, we don't mean something as simple as like, you know, financial literacy or business acumen, um, but it, it, the federal government's literally flushing so much money down to the local level. And for us as a community development financial institution and the largest black led minority develop, um, depository institution, they are counting on us, right? To, to bring the government to the people. And so for the next five years, um, there's literally a grant that's gonna last for 10 years, not a grant, but it's money coming down from the treasury that you know is um, intended to last a span of 10 years to help close the racial wealth gap. And um, just in five years alone, you know, I think we'll be able to make, you know, some deep strides that at least pull more people up into, you know, this pathway to prosperity, if you will. 
Um, so that's what five years, you know, I think, you know, could look like or, you know, God willing, will look like. Thanks so much. I mean, and yeah, there's, we, we could talk at length about connecting uh, young entrepreneurs and growing businesses with capital. I know it's a huge uh, concern and like, especially in, the, in our DC area. Uh, anybody else in the, uh, have questions for Gloria? I, I, I generally don't have, don't actually talk I generally put questions. This is the first time that I talk, but I just want to say to the team that it's such a pleasure having Gloria here. You can, I can talk with Gloria for hours about anything and everything, her mind, her creativity. It's very hard sometimes to be creative and business, business savvy. And she has like those two brains very, you know, I think because of the experience. And I think because one of the things that I think is important in people is the curiosity. Gloria is always curious about anything and everything. So sometimes we're we're bouncing ideas. We were bouncing ideas with Gloria the other day about um, you know how how to, how we can be inclusive and how she was doing it in her business and how we were doing going and doing ULI. And I just realized her her background is just so cool and so diverse. And and we had brunch the other day with with someone that Gloria worked with, and it's just these are stories about business owners and marketing, and it's just fantastic. It's just I I know Gloria is just disclosing a little portion of 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 information in our talks, but I'm so excited uh, that she's with us because in in a way she's like you guys, creative, very creative people, and like some other other you guys were. Is all about you know business and strategy, and I think that fusion really comes through because of just she's always hungry to to learn, and and I think it always plays well when you are in a company and when you are working with the government, when you're in private sector. So thank you, Gloria, for being with us. Thank you for that. Thank you for having me. We have a question from Aura. She says. What are you optimistic about when it comes to storytelling and stories being more accessible through social media and other communication mediums? What am I optimistic about? Let's see. I mean, just, I, I love that. Um, are you guys still there? I, um, I love that. I love all the, what do they call it? They're like the pan media, um, trans media, uh, just the multiple levels of uh, distribution. So anybody can access telling their own story. Anybody can do a podcast. Anybody can now trace their genealogy. Anybody can study anything. And so um, I am optimistic, mostly though about like the youth and their ability to learn um, and then investigate and um, have apply critical thinking to what they are learning, um, whether it's from media, from home, from school, and then have these discussions on all these free platforms. Um, I think that people are feeling more liberated um, across all ethnicities, generations to tell their own stories. Um, you know, in a, in a time that we are being labeled as this or that, and I'm, the example I'm trying to use is, um, are we supposed to be Hispanic or Latino, Oriental or Asian, African American or Black? We have to tell our own stories. But of course, then the question is like, okay, well, just because Gloria says it, you know, who made her the expert? But imagine um, the archives a hundred years from now when you, 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 you have all told your own story and then you, mm -hmm. you, and then you have this, this repository of um, opinions, if you will. Um, I'm optimistic that, you mm -hmm. know, when people have command of their own narrative um, and their own storytelling and what they're seeing on the ground, um, that again, you know, the, the posterity of, you know, of um, holding that is, is going to be something to behold 100 years from now. And I think I probably mean in particular now, I mean, the world is just going through so much. And the more artists that can paint, and I just want to give a shout out to the artists who are really um, responding 
in um, responding to the times and driving the times and at the same time making money from it, but just truly just self-motivated um, to storytell um, what is literally happening all over the world in a way that um, journalists aren't quite capturing, you know, so, or capturing differently, I would say. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely it's like it's, it's great that people can tell their own stories in their own ways now, uh, it's, and it's media has really helped with that. Uh, Gloria, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you, and like Paula says, I feels like uh, there's so much that you've touched on that I just want to really go into in much more depth. But I know that uh, it's twelve o'clock, so I want to make sure that <laughs> uh, everyone we can respect everyone's time. Thanks so much for joining us, and I hope that we can uh, talk again soon. Thanks so Great. Much. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you. Much. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.